Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Well, tomorrow is Independence Day. Yep, yep. It's Fourth of July Eve. Yeah. Actually, I would say yesterday was Independence Day, right? Uh, Jul- yeah, July 2nd is when the, the Lee Resolution was signed. That's the actual legal separation from yeah. Britain, Great Britain. And really, it should be the day we celebrate. Although, yeah, it was. Um, I think it was uh, John Chris, Adams, maybe, or it's one, one of the founding fathers and early presidents said that you yeah. know July second will be a day celebrated for all eternity or whatever. <laughs> and now most people don't even know. Yeah, yeah. which is which is crazy. Yeah. But it was a big deal to declare. Yeah. Well, the the Lee resolution is kind of the declaration. Was the, the, de- the declaration yeah. itself is the explanation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, this is how we justify our, uh, sedition. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. but, uh, anyway, happy day all the same. Uh, yeah. I'm, you know, I worry about it sometimes, whether it means the same thing. Like 4th of July is really just a day for Cook drinking whiskey and, and <laughs> eating barbecue, right? Like drinking that Budweiser, yeah. <laughs> shooting some fireworks. Yeah. <sighs> Absolutely. I do enjoy shooting fireworks. Ah, oh, we're going to shoot some fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> mm, it's blowing stuff up, man. There's nothing quite like blowing stuff up. It's an American tradition. Agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, I, I guess I wanted to start off today uh, speaking of American traditions. That's terrible. <laughs> it's not, terrible segue. That's not going to segue well into this. No, no. It's, it's not. Um, but... A uh, week, two weeks ago, here my papers rattling. Um, two weeks ago, a there was an open letter um, signed by a bunch of wealthy billionaires, top, you know, the, the some of the one, wealthiest people in the U.S. I think anybody over forty nine million, I think, is what they said. Well, yeah, but that's not who signed it. No, 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 that's <laughs> not who signed it. But that's what that's yeah. the that was the idea though right yeah. i mean i guess they were more wealthy than that the people that signed it oh yeah um well the letter is uh to the 2020 presidential candidates and it is requesting a wealth tax um and their proposal is that a uh, wealth tax on the richest one-tenth of one percent of americans um and that it would uh tax um two two percent on assets over 50 million and another uh, an additional cent, so three three percent total on um, wealth over uh, a billion or assets over a billion. Wow. Um, and they say that it'll generate about three trillion dollars in tax revenue, and, which I have uh, to over say, ten years. I have to say that's what struck me the most was the the money that it's going to generate. Because I mean, to your everyday person, that seems like a lot of money. But as far as a government budget is concerned especially over 10 years yeah that's almost nothing yeah um i mean and then they go through the list at towards the end of this of everything they want to do with this money it's like man that money's not going to touch that yeah well like, they they mentioned it at the beginning and even like what they expect this to do and yeah. so right three trillion dollars over 10 years 300 billion dollars a year um just bear in mind that the current federal budget is like 4.7 trillion a year yeah. and the current revenue is three and a half trillion yeah. so assuming no other changes they right. would go from three and a half trillion to 3.8 trillion we'd still be almost a trillion short of what we spend yeah uh in the budget so um i it i don't see that and, it's really helping that much and, and i think that the assuming that things don't change is important mm-hmm. because if there's anything we know when you add a new tax in especially to people making that have this type of money they're going to make adjustments oh yeah i mean they they're not going to just accept that you know i mean it's, some may but most won't most will make adjustments into whatever the system is to to account for that. Yeah, so you're the, not going to bring in what you say you're going to bring in, not without making more changes. No, exactly. This is why uh, tax attorneys and um, and CPAs are a huge business. Oh, yeah. It, the whole point of having these people is so that you don't have to pay those extra taxes. That's the, that's why you yeah, pay them. That's the worst. It's because it's cheaper than actually paying the government. Exactly. Um, but I, I was struck by a bunch of things about this. Um, 
you know, they say that it'll it'll only affect the seventy five thousand wealthiest families in the United States, yeah. and uh, I, I think that it's it's awfully generous of these twenty people who signed this letter to offer up the wealth of seventy five thousand. Um, yeah, you know, I, I would agree with that too. Um, and and it's it's a wealth tax on top of that. So I mean, we don't currently have a tax that operates this way. No. So how would you? Because Elizabeth Warren made a comment earlier, was it this week or after one of the debates, about um, wanting to have a wealth tax. And, and the question was raised, well, how would you enforce that? Mm. And her response was, we will put a ton of money into enforcement. Which, okay, which that can only lead to privacy violations because that's just the government snooping into your affairs even more. And to mm. think that it'll stop with just the rich is is pretty well i mean we do have similar types of taxes your property taxes are essentially yeah. a wealth tax and, agreed <clears throat> but uh yeah th- it wouldn't to this extent it hasn't been applied and you know there are questions about how you would value some things and so forth but yeah. I, I think those are kind of non-issues honestly yeah. um in terms of this like just on at the very beginning or not the very beginning but a you know a few paragraphs into this um they say this revenue could substantially fund the cost of smart investments in our future, like clean energy innovation to mitigate climate change, universal child care, student loan debt relief, infrastructure modernization, tax credits for low-income families, public health solutions, and other vital needs. And the answer to that is, no, it couldn't. Yeah, there's, that money could maybe do one of those things. Not maybe? Even. No, not even. I mean, I looked up some of the stuff, the things that we're already doing. Yeah. Um, remember that they would be generating $300 billion a year. Yeah. Um, uh, roughly. Yeah. Estimated at $300 billion a year. Uh, the Green New Deal, the climate day- change stuff. Yeah. $50 trillion over 10 years. So that's $5 <laughs> trillion dollars a year. Not even close. Not even good. Um, universal health care is estimated to cost around $2 trillion a year. Again, you know... <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. Um, and student loan debt, the existing student loan debt in this country is one and a half trillion dollars. Man, that's one that irritates me too. Yeah, I, we can get back we'll, to that. I later, was going right? to say we'll probably end up at some point doing a podcast on that because because that one gets to me. Yeah. Um, so the and you know I didn't I didn't do anything for universal child care because we don't really do anything like that. I can't imagine what that would cost. No, there's no telling um, what that would run. Infrastructure modernization. Uh, I mean, like currently uh, the government spends like I think in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year on infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously that's not getting us very far. I suppose if they put their entire $300 billion to that, it might make a it difference. It might make a But the federal government isn't isn't responsible for most infrastructure. I mean, the federal government's really only responsible for interstates. Yeah. Like, all your your bridges that are falling apart in, you know, Bowen <laughs> County or whatever are responsible. Like, Bowen County is the responsible Yeah, it's, it's part. county it's and like, state, right? Yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, I just don't see that as a, as a big thing. I don't know what other vital needs they're talking about, so obviously I couldn't get any estimates on what those <laughs> things would cost. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's... So then they go into like specific things that they want it to do. Um, and the first one, of course, is a wealth tax is a powerful tool for solving our climate crisis. Um, <clears throat> and they say uh, it could accelerate innovation and speed implementation of solutions for a clean energy economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it, it actually it does the opposite, or at least history would suggest that it would do the opposite because yeah. central planning just – it's central planning, which is corporatism in a lot of ways. That you know, it's or it would lead to corporatism. Then, yeah. then you got people like vying for these contracts to do these development programs. It would be a whole new Boeing, Raytheon, um, yeah. Lockheed Martin kind of scenario, except with climate stuff instead, where they go way over budget. Nothing works like it's supposed to. They can't get anything finished on time, and it's spending taxpayer dollars to do it. Yeah. Um, the free enterprise system works better. I've said over and over again, I'm pretty sure I've said on this podcast, like if you want to fix, like if you're really concerned about the climate and you want green energy, and I, I agree, like renewable energy is a hell of a lot better than non-renewable well, energy. Yeah. Um, but if you want to to solve that, 
you got to leave it to the market. Yeah. And if you just opened up the market, got the government out of the way, and let people become more prosperous, then they would start making decisions based on their conscience instead of on their checkbook balance. Yeah. And if they're making decisions based on their conscience instead of their checkbook balance, then you have more money feeding into these industries, and they develop faster and eventually they're competitive. And you get and you get what you were wanting the whole time anyway. Right. Um, I mean, you know, we can we can say this at the end or we can just go ahead and say it right here at the beginning too. All of the things that they recommend, yeah. nothing's stopping them from doing it themselves. Yeah. Well that's <sighs> and that's kind of the overwhelming thing here. I mean, if they really wanted to take this type of stuff on they could all get together just the 20 of them Mm -hmm. and and make some headway in some of these areas i mean and if they through the private sector and if not through the private sector they could just write checks to the government nobody's stopping them (laughs) i mean you know i'm just saying government never turns away money yeah like i say and that's another reason why this wouldn't work like even if they increased the revenue of the government by 300 billion dollars a year yeah there's no way that the government just like, oh, okay, well, what do you want us to do with that? And even if yeah. they did, isn't that another thing that they're complaining about? <laughs> Is right? people writing checks to the government and getting what they want out of it? I mean, yeah. but it's their thing and it's you know exactly. righteous or whatever. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, their next thing is uh, wealth tax is an economic winner for America. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly how they calculate this. <laughs> um, taking money out of people's pockets even the wealthiest people in america and putting it in the hands of the governments doesn't seem like an economic winner to me um essentially you're you're taking money that was generated through productive work and giving it to uh, an entity that produces nothing yeah and that is extremely good at wasting money yeah like i mean they they're not efficient yeah don't (laughs) underestimate the power of the profit uh, motive. Oh, absolutely. That's essentially yeah. like profit and loss is what keeps businesses streamlined in the free market. And yeah. the government doesn't have to worry about that. Exactly. Um, I've, I've been meaning to get more details, but you know, my dad was with the FBI for 30 years and uh, he had told me um, that when they're doing undercover businesses, when they set up a, a an undercover business so that they can, you know, either... Um, just surveil a location or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they are forbidden from um, setting up a business where they're in that business exists within the the area or whatever. Like essentially, they can't oh, really? set up a, a fake business that competes with a real with business another real business because yeah. the government doesn't have to worry about profit, so <laughs> they can always outcompete. Yeah, a market because, business because they can lose and lose and lose, and they just take it out of us. Yeah, exactly. They just yeah, and they can just bleed the competition dry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple of things to note in this paragraph about the wealth tax being an economic winner. Um, they say easing student debt would boost entrepreneurship and homeownership rates, and I, I thought that that was funny because it seems to me like you know you say that um, you're going to relieve these students of their um, of their college debts so that they can take on a mortgage debt. Yeah. Like you're essentially trading one loan they can't repay for a new loan that they can't repay. That they're not going to repay, yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, it seems to me that there was and a it, problem with people not paying back mortgage loans that created a, an a issue bubble? a few years yeah. ago. Did we have a bubble due to that? Yeah. But on top of that, that makes it worse for the people who did the right thing. The person who went to school or went to community college mm-hmm. and paid for their school that wants to go buy a home now would be competing in a market with all of these people who had their debt wiped away. Yeah. Well, and it generates bad incentives. Yeah. Um, it essentially tells people that they can take on debt that they can't afford because the government will pay them back. Yeah. Um, exactly. The government will handle it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, so you've essentially incentivized people in the same way that they did with the bailouts. It doesn't just apply to students like this. I mean, yeah. um, it, the same thing happened with the banks. And that's why we're probably heading into another recession now. Like we're definitely yeah. building up another big bubble. Yeah. And a big part of that is because they didn't just let the banks fail. Too big to <laughs> fail is absurd because what it says to a company is that you can take really risky you can like make really serious risky choices risk. yeah. and not have to worry about it because the government will... Somebody's going to yeah, step in and... Fill in the, yeah. the gap, you know, put you back in the black. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, trade off one loan for another loan. You know, it's, I, it's, it's just, it just kind of occurred to me a way to maybe fix that problem, though. If 
if you set up a system where any bank that was bailed out, mm -hmm. the people who were in charge in that bank, like actually went to jail. So yeah. like you save the bank, mm -hmm. but you like seriously punish the people who are responsible. I don't know. It just occurred to me. Yeah, but nobody got punished for it. No, well, no, but nobody did. <laughs> but that's the problem, though. Mm -hmm. That which is the reason was what creates kind of the situation that we ended up with, where it's just going to repeat itself again. But if all the people who were truly responsible for two thousand eight, like, were still in jail now, mm -hmm. I bet people now would be at the top of those banks would be making a lot different decisions than what they made. Well, they were kind of incentivized again by the government to make the decisions that they made that led to that in the first place. Well, yeah, because the government, the government, because the government wants because the government wants that. They, yeah. I mean it it would be I mean it's certainly not outside the the realm of what the government is willing to do, but yeah. it would be pretty hypocritical of the federal government to put people in jail for following the instructions of the federal government. Yeah. Agreed. Um, which is essentially what happened in a, in a lot of cases with the Affordable uh, Housing Act and all that oh, stuff. Yeah, because you know? yeah, I remember living through that time where that was there was a big push for that. It was like, oh, like, well. Everybody needs to own a home. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. You know, some people pretty, put pretty themselves in a position to, to do that. Well, it's pretty close to what you hear now with health care being their right. I well, mean, it, yeah. was, it was the same type of language for home ownership in, in the, leading up to that crisis. Because I remember that. Yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, it wasn't exactly the same, mm -hmm. but it wasn't that much different either. Yeah. Well, they also say uh, America's entrepreneurial economy um, needs strengthening. Yeah. And so, but if you're doing this through a government program, if you're funding entrepreneurs through a government program, who decides what's a good idea and what isn't? Yeah. Like. Right. And don't you know? Don't even try to convince me that that wouldn't lead to some kind of corruption. Oh yeah, um, that, that's got it you know, written the, all the, over the, it. Yeah, that the government agents sitting there deciding who gets a loan and who doesn't to start their new business. Yeah. You know, There's going to be some kickback somewhere there. And that brings up another point, actually. Like all of these things that they want to do, all these programs that they want to start. What is what is it going to cost? For new government, all these new government agencies needed to administrate, administer, yeah. administrate. I, that administer. was one of my terrible, <laughs> like grammar things. Um, administer all all of these new programs. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like, um, so we're only two down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a long list here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Um, a wealth tax will make Americans healthier. Oh yeah, right. um, and they, you know, they talk about these various studies that show that uh, inequalities linked to lower life expectancies and so on. In fact, um, it's a, I'm going to read from the from the letter here. It says uh, the wealthiest Americans are now estimated to live up to 15 years longer than the poorest Americans, and individuals living in disadvantaged communities are more likely to die before the age of 75, regardless of their income level. Now, first off, 75 is pretty old anyway. Yeah. I would suggest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but even like okay, so taking all that is you know, I, it's almost certainly true. The statistics are almost certainly true. I didn't bother to look it up, but they cite something, and so it's probably. I true. mean, I, I would it would stand the reason that I believe that. But here's a here's another explanation for it besides the fact that the inequality is the cause of all this. Maybe, because this is, you know, correlation is not causation, right? Yeah. Um, maybe it's the same kind of poor choices in their life that led to both their inequality and their poor life expectancy. Yeah. It might be the decisions that they made that made them unsuccessful and those same kinds of decisions made them unhealthy. Yeah. The And the... <sighs> It goes back to this is blaming the victim in the worst possible way, well, right? It, it, maybe it is, but it, but it's true though because I mean we want to live in a society that's free, and that's one going back to the universal health care. When you thing. say free, you mean freedom, or do you mean no cost? Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was. I, just, I would hope that's assumed. <laughs> no, I, I just want you to clarify. I don't want any misunderstandings. Right. Fair enough, mm -hmm. but um. Yeah, we want to live in a society with freedom. Okay, there you go. <laughs> um, because Ocasio-Cortez wants to live in a society that's, that's free. That's free. Yeah, agreed. Right. <laughs> agreed. Um, but it goes back to do, do what I worry about with universal health care. Because you, if, if the government is responsible for your health care, then, then it's only a small leap to say, well, 
we can't pay for you to be a smoker mm-hmm. or to eat unhealthy because yeah. you're costing the government money by doing this. Um, and and it's it's only a small step. I mean, it's the phase one would be universal health care. Phase two would be, all right, how are we going to control cost? Mm-hmm. And that's an easy way to do it. And then you've got the arm of the government that's there that can start regulating a lot of these industries. I mean, yeah. it... It, it happens quick. Well, and, and that's a, a good point is that every time you accept help from the government, you give up a little freedom to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I this, used to listen really consistently to uh, Kara Santa Maria. She does um, the uh, Talk Nerdy podcast. Yeah. Um, used to be Talk Nerdy to me on Huff, HuffPo, but, yeah. which I thought was really clever. But anyway, um, I don't really listen to it so much anymore because my time is taken up with other things that I think are more important. But it is it, it can be it's very fascinating. It's yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interviews with a bunch of scientists and so forth. But uh, one of the things – she's like a radical progressive. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that she used to say all the time was she was talking trash about us down here in the South. All right? <laughs> oh, and she yeah. was saying that she doesn't understand – us, essentially us stupid Southerners that vote against our own interest all the time by continuing to vote for Republicans instead of Democrats that are going to give us stuff. Since the South is one of the poorest areas in the country, why in the world do we keep voting for Republicans instead of Democrats that are offering us all these things? Yeah. It's against our own interest, right? Yeah. And I, I would say that the answer is because the Southerners recognize that they don't want to give up that kind of authority over their own lives in yeah. order for some, just for some security some, and comfort. Some temporary comfort. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a, it's a it's, recognition that every time you give the government um, every, access to some part of your life, you give up control of that yep, part of your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is a wealth tax is fair. Hmm. Uh, I, I find it interesting that they think it's fair that the 20 of them can speak for 75,000 um, <laughs> families that would be affected. I was uh, going to say that they maybe they should all get together and hold a vote and see how that comes out. Yeah, well, that's the, <laughs> well. I mean, that's something that they point out is that yeah. the 20 of them and most Americans uh, are in favor of Well, I'm tax. sure most Americans are because guess what? Most, I mean, you can vote away. Like, that's, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, it's that thing of like if you get in a group of people and you vote for yeah. who's going to pay for the bill at dinner. Well, yeah. Like, exactly. is that really fair that yeah. the four the person who loses that in? vote is that fair to them? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and uh, okay, so I'm um, actually I'm glad I brought this in here now because uh, it reminded me of the quote. So I've been reading this book about the um, the Scopes trial. Oh, really? Um, and you know, all those years ago, and and uh, uh, about. Well, forget it. You should just look up the Scopes trial. Yeah. There's no sense in me spending a whole bunch of time explaining all that. But yeah. um, anyway, uh, there was a quote in the book from uh, Nicholas Murray Butler. It was, it was com- He was commenting on the Scopes trial. He's the former president of Columbia University. Okay. And um, he said, The notion that a majority must have its way, whether in matters of opinion or in matters of personal conduct, is as pestilent and anti-democratic a notion as can possibly be conceived. I'd agree with that. <laughs> yeah. um, the, this whole idea that everything's fine as long as we voted on it and the majority got their way is just a, is just absurd. Yeah. Well, and that's um, the reason we have a republic and not a democracy. Yeah. It, because our founders recognize that, that the democracy is not the best system. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, back to my favorite Ben Franklin quote, you know, yeah. uh, democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Exactly. Um, so uh, the the idea that democracy that if you have a vote that the majority will is the way to go and it's it's right yeah. that's really the problem. Yeah. Um, you know there there have been a majority in favor of various terrible terrible things in the past and yeah. um, the whole point of having the constitution is to protect our natural rights but yeah. we ignore the whole thing at this point so. My it's not point, doing a lot of good. But. My point in this letter, though, when I read that section, mm-hmm. was that maybe just them, if you had just, yeah, that, just the 20 people, just well, no, just the 75,000 people, mm-hmm. if they all voted to oh, implement yeah. this or not. Yeah. But how do you think that vote's going to come out? <laughs> because they'd all be voting for the same thing to vote for themselves a tax increase. They're not going to agree to that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But because they're actually- not, because here's the reason why it may not even be about the money so much. But it's about where the money goes because all that whole seventy-five thousand people aren't going to 
necessarily agree with everything. Prioritize the same things that exactly. these guys do. Yeah. yeah. Um, interestingly, though, there is a statement in this particular section yeah. that I completely agree with. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they said, uh, taxing extraordinary wealth should be a greater priority than taxing hard work. Well... I think a wealth tax is way fair in terms of, like, especially if you're, now I'm opposed to all tax. Let me go ahead and, <laughs> all right. you know, set that Preface forward. that, yeah. yeah. But um, I, I think that a wealth tax is is uh, far more reasonable than an income tax. Yeah. Well, I'd agree with that. Uh, an income but tax re- just prevents people from ac- accumulating wealth. But the idea of the income tax originally was only supposed to be on the top percent. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be on everybody. Yeah. But that's but you open doors, so things like this open doors. So mm-hmm. yeah, right now they want to do this on just the top percent. But when they realize that they can't generate the funds they want to, it's going to move down and down and down till it's me and you. Yeah. Well, and they point out in this that the um, that they the top one tenth of one percent only pays a little over three percent of their total wealth in taxes, whereas the everybody else pays about seven percent. Um, yeah. And that this, you know, this will fix this that will, problem. This will level that out. Yeah. Um, although, if you think about it, uh, they're only talking about adding an additional three percent, so it's still less it's than still the better. Yeah. But they're, they're still anyway, coming out ahead. Um, and that's also, like you said at the beginning, assuming that there's no change in their behavior. Yep. Like I, I don't know why you would do anything other than to put anything over fifty million or anything over a billion into some kind of uh, a trust that's not. Um, under your control or that you wouldn't, uh, instead of um, acquiring it, you would get it through various benefits and yeah. so forth that don't actually belong to you, but you have access to. I mean, yeah. there's a whole lot of there's ways so around so many this. ways. Besides I mean, these, the these people didn't get where they are for being dumb. <laughs> yeah. It's like that Simpsons episode where Bill Gates comes in to buy out Homer's uh, <laughs> online business or whatever. Yeah. And he says, uh, okay, well, I accept your offer and, and Bill Gates, you know, tough guys go in and start knocking stuff over and throwing things around. And he's like, wait, I thought you were buying me out. He's like, I am. I didn't get this to be rich by giving away all my money. Right. <laughs> or writing a bunch of checks. Writing I think a bunch is, of checks. That's yeah. what he says. <laughs> um, so on to the next point. Uh, a wealth tax strengthens American freedom and democracy. Um, and it's an interesting way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, I don't even know how they get the. So you're giving, you're making the government bigger, and I cannot think of a single example ever in the history of mankind where bigger government restores freedom and democracy. Yeah, yeah, it t- tends to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it says the founders of America knew this and feared that an economic elite might become ensconced as leaders and erode the effectiveness of the Republic. Um, and you know, they're talking about, you know, the economic system leading to this. Yeah. And my response to that is then in that case, if they understood this and they, they foresaw it, like they did so many things. Yeah. Um, why didn't they give the government the power over the economy? Right. <laughs> I mean, that seems like the easy answer if that's the answer, right? Yeah. Um, but they gave the federal government exactly zero power over the economy. Well, not entirely. I mean, they did, a, you yeah. know, allow them to uh, regulate trade in, in some ways and so forth. But yeah. that was mostly, again, that's that was outward stuff. facing. Yeah. You know. Um, so, anyway, it's, and they, of course, they talk about, uh, you know, money and politics and so forth. Yeah. And um, I would again say, like I always say, if you if you want money out of politics, you got to first take politics out of money. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. And it, you know, it's not going to work any other way. And um, and finally, their last point, and it seems appropriate finally. going into <laughs> the Independence Day, a wealth tax is patriotic. Oh well, it has to be patriotic. Paying taxes is patriotic. Yeah. <laughs> And so, again, you know, there's nothing that stops them from doing this on their own, um, except that you don't get to use the force of government to volunteer 74,980 other families' <laughs> uh, wealth to support your goals. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, you know, then they talk about some of the arguments against, but they don't really address them, and so it's not really anything yeah. useful. Um 
Yeah, and they, they do point out that the Office of Legal Counsel, like the question about whether this is constitutional or not, yeah. um, that the some uh, two former heads of the office, I'm going to read from it here. Okay. Um, two former heads of the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice have argued convincingly that a wealth tax is constitutional because, now I'm not quoting <laughs> anymore, this is All me right, now. this is going to be you. <laughs> because why would government employees... <laughs> ever make the case that the government should have more power. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, mm. I, so, I don't know. I, I I think that this is one of those things where, again, of course, they could do this on their own, yeah. except they wouldn't be able to force everybody else into it if they did it on their own. And they wouldn't have the public... You know, recognition, recognition. of well, their great it's, virtue. It's it's a it's a virtue signal. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's at the end of the day. When I read this, that's that's what I took away. Is this is all of this whole group of people, just one big virtue signal? Yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, it's probably it's going to cost them nothing. It's going to be good um, publicity for them. Yep. Um, you know, this is the oh, Soros yeah, and the Disney's and the. I know. was fixing to say Abigail Disney was on NPR talking about this the other day. I yeah. mean, it was a, it's a way to get them out there in front of people. Yep. See how wonderful I am. How how much I care about those poor people that I step on every day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So that's enough of that. I, and it actually leads into I, I didn't really want to talk about the debates. Yeah. But I don't see how we don't talk about the debates. <laughs> we can't just ignore them. Um so they had twenty people up there and of course I was pulling for Tulsi. Well you kinda have to. I mean I I disagree with her on a lot of things. But oh, she yeah. gets it right on foreign policy. Yeah, she gets it right on some things that really matter a lot. She's yeah. she's good on personal freedom. She's good against the surveillance state. She's good on foreign policy. Yeah. Um, you know, these are things that really matter. She's terrible on economics. You know, she's a $15 yeah. minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but, universal health care. <clears throat> I mean. But none of that stuff will ever really happen anyway. I mean, it's not well, likely to. It's not likely to, but it's, even even still. I'd, but she is in a position to pull people out of war she could she could as be a president. well and she could oh if she was a president absolutely she and i think unlike i mean we've seen this from every presidential candidate that's won that where they they campaign on this and then they don't do it mm-hmm. i do think that she'd actually do it uh, i think i that think she'd do her best i think she'd do her best i think i don't know how easy it is at this point well i don't know because i i said the same thing about trump i mean i, I believe that that was the one thing that i thought that he would do was the anti-war stuff, and and he's he's been better than most. I mean, you can give yeah. him that. I mean, he's not good. He hasn't started a new war. He yet. hasn't he hasn't started a new war yet. We're really close. Though. Yeah, we are really. Close. Um, and you know, I mean, he's. He, I'll give him. He's been better than most. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not good. But, yeah. You know, none of them have been. It's I. I there hasn't yeah. been a president in my lifetime that I have approved of their job. Yeah. At least as far as... And even looking back through history, I don't think that there's been a president since the 19th century <laughs> that I have approved of their job. But, yeah. you know, that eh, I'm, I might be the radical. I don't think that I am. I don't know, I don't know how are. that happened. I, I just somehow, being a constitutionalist at worst... Yeah. Like, I know that I, I go a little past that, but I would be perfectly content with the constitutional well, government. That's always... Perfectly content with the constitutional government, and yet somehow that makes me a radical now. Yeah. And eh, I, I would like to say it's, that's a newer thing, but I don't even know that it so much is. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, my my quick hits on the, uh, on the debates were um, uh, Biden and Bernie both really want you to look at stuff. Like, yeah, <laughs> really want you to look at stuff. They they pretty much start every statement with, "Look, oh. the top one tenth of one percent. Look, yeah, that's not what I said. Look, I mean, <laughs> look, that's not what I yeah. said. <laughs> Poor Biden, man, he got beat up on in that yeah. in that debate. Like everybody was after Biden, and of course he's the front runner. He's the front it makes runner. Sense, so but, I mean, that's gonna happen. Um, yeah, I just, I almost felt bad for him at some point. But like, the, the funny thing about him is he he can't handle it. Like he's he's no. not. I think he might be. Well, he's he's fairly charismatic. Like he's good giving a speech. Yeah. Uh, but 
in that this, in this that type really, of forum is he's just for not him. smart enough i don't think he's not quick with it enough yeah. and he should be because he's been doing it long enough yeah well but of course you it goes back to be the the positions he's held i guess he wasn't exactly in a whole lot of debates per se yeah i mean maybe town forums and stuff like that but um kamala uh, or Kamala. Kamala. She used to be Kamala. So. Now she's Kamala. I, oh, I yeah. guess There's been a like, shift here. <laughs> yeah, she's really playing into the ethnic thing, I think, is yeah. what it was, because it used to be Kamala. She was always Kamala for years and years. Yeah. And now she's Kamala. Yeah. Um, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. She is a storyteller. <laughs> yeah, you think she's so? She's got a story for everything. She's yeah. constantly telling stories. I wish I'd written this down, because there was some story that she told that I was like, yeah, that is just a complete and utter lie. <laughs> That's a fabrication there is just, right there. There is no way that that is true. Um, but I, I didn't write down what it was because I, I, if I had, I would have gone back and just like looked she it up. She does have but a I, history of telling untruths. Th- so. that's, yes, that's certainly true. <laughs> Apparently she was listening to Snoop Dogg's new album before it even came out. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, that's a minor lie. But I think it's effective in, in some ways. It's like it's yeah. kind of endearing at first. It got annoying after a while, all the storytelling. Yeah. And, um, and she's really aggressive. Oh, she's uh, definitely aggressive. And I think that that's a benefit to her. I think that's a that's a valuable attribute in something like this. Yeah. Um, something Bernie could take a hand from because if Bernie's <clears throat> going to get the nomination, he's going to have to to yeah, toughen up. Like he's, he's going to uh, have to be more aggressive. And I don't know if it's any. I don't think it is. I yeah. think he's a weakling. Yeah. I, you know. Um, but we'll whatever. See. Yeah. Um, Kirsten Gillibrand. Yeah. Apparently has the most comprehensive answer to everything. <laughs> she has the most comprehensive plan, yeah. no matter what the topic is. Nice. She said that over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, well, I am. I have the most comprehensive plan for addressing student debt. I have the most comprehensive plan for uh, firearms uh, control. I have the most comprehensive plan for the economy. I have the most. She had. <laughs> She's she comprehensive. Had the most comprehensive yeah. plan. She spent a lot of time planning. Yeah, a lot of time. <laughs> Practicing um, using that word. Yeah. Uh, big loser from night one. Yeah. Beto O'Rourke. Ah. He can deliver a speech. He, he can. can't handle this. He didn't <laughs> answer anything. Yeah. Not in any language. <laughs> any language, right? <laughs> um, he Ooh. just. Like, he managed to avoid every single question that was asked of him. And I think that he's just, like, the, it, he looked he looked bad. He looked bad, yeah. Really bad. Yeah. Um, he was just seemed completely unprepared and didn't have anything solid yeah. for anything. Um, and there was a few times where they asked him a question and he would give an answer not to that question. Yeah. And they would ask him that question again and he would give an answer not to that question again. And yeah. they were like, yes, but what I'm asking is... Yeah. Blah, they, blah, blah. they would push and him he, on yeah. it. Yeah. And he still wouldn't answer. <laughs> it's terrible. Oh, I hate it when they do that. They should turn their mar- mics off when they do that. <laughs> <laughs> they should turn their mics off a lot. When they keep talking past the end, yeah. um, we're like, uh, well, it was terribly moderated, actually. Yeah. I, I mean, it was like really bad. Um, instead of, uh, you know, giving them some kind of warning, um, and then, you letting know, them wrap like up. really, yeah. And letting them finish like, yeah. okay, here, finish the thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, instead what they did was they just like interrupted them over and over again after they went <laughs> over time and the people just kept on talking. And there were a lot of times where I was just like screaming at the monitor, just like <laughs> just turn off the up. mic, just <laughs> turn off their mic, shut them up. Yeah. Um, Cory Booker. Oh man. Yeah. Cory Booker. He's, uh. I think that he should move. <laughs> you probably. think he was a bad Yeah, I mean, he told he told some stories like he's listening to gunshots at night and like uh, you know break-ins and what have you. He apparently lives in a terrible neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, the man makes well, took close to two hundred thousand dollars a year in Congress. He should probably move to a gated community, or like <laughs> you, um, so? you know, get better security or. So. I, I'm not yeah. sure, but I, I'm thinking that he should probably move. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> the the general reviews were that Julian Castro did well in night one. Yeah. Um. Eh. I mean, he he stayed on message better than most of them. Yeah. Uh. For me, I, Tulsi was in night one. Yeah. She did okay. Yeah. Um. She did a good job. She did some of the things that I think that she should do. Yeah. Um. She definitely seemed nervous, but she displayed a lot of poise. I think that that's good. Also. Yeah. Um. She. Uh, she stayed on foreign policy. 
Well, that's what she needs to do. That's, I mean, mm-hmm. that's the winning issue for her. Yeah. And, and in, but in that group, I think, I mean. And she uh, had a really great exchange with that idiot Tim yeah, Ryan. Yeah, she did. Man, she ate him up. That was fun. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think he's an example of how the level of knowledge of the majority of those candidates. Yeah, because he can play it off saying that, well, he meant support and that blah, blah, blah. That ain't what he meant. No, no. I mean, when he didn't know you, the difference. He didn't know the difference. When you listen to that, it's Taliban clear. and Al Qaeda, they're the same thing. They were the same thing in his eye. I'm sure yeah. he knows better now because yeah. somebody set him down, mm-hmm. but he didn't during that exchange. No. And who can blame him because the, you know, the media and our government did everything they could they could to conflate those two. Yeah. Pretty Without, much throughout this war, actually, yeah, but absolutely, like certainly at the beginning, they that's yeah. how we got into uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in the first place. Absolutely. Is by by claiming that the uh, Al Qaeda and the Taliban the, were the same thing. These are the bad guys. But it's yeah. it's like the difference between um, De Blasio and the mafia boss. Yeah, exactly. Uh, really, I mean, Taliban is a government organization, and they may yeah. not be great. In fact, they're certainly not. Yeah. But they're a government organization. They're like established power, and they yeah. are legitimate. They, and Al Qaeda is a bunch of ruffians. It's, it's a it's a mafia. It's a bunch of gangsters. Yeah. There's a very big difference between those two things, regardless of what we think of them. Yeah. Because you're, at the end of the day, you're not going to wipe out the government anyway. I mean, you may. Yeah, we but, can we can cross our fingers on that, but it's it's yeah, not likely. I mean, um, stay there forever. So I, I yeah, she handled that pretty well, um, and I, I thought she did all in all a, a pretty good job. And it was really apparent why she needs to be on the debate stage because in night two, I'm pretty sure they didn't talk about foreign policy at all. Yeah. Um, um, well, except when they were uh, attacking President Trump for meeting with Kim Jong Un. Oh yeah. yeah, that's the only time they talked about foreign policy, and that wasn't brought up by the moderators. That was brought up by the people on stage. And I have yeah. to question their their sense thought anyway. process here yeah. anyway. Yeah, like how is it that that is a bad thing? You may not like this guy, but definitely talking to him is better than not. Yeah, without question. <laughs> we're we are safer from North Korea now than we were when Trump took office. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that that's debatable. It's not. There's no way. I mean, you know, it's, they, you know, and I had somebody at my office say, "Well, he hadn't negotiated anything. Like, well, well, he hasn't finalized any deal, but he's been negotiating." Yeah, and they ain't shooting rockets off anymore. Yeah, and I bet that's a win for some of the neighbors. <laughs> I bet South Korea appreciates that. Yeah, I bet Japan does too. Yeah, you know they do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I still think that this is a win. This has been. This has been one of the best things that Trump has done since he's taken office. This is like one of the few things that I really am all on board with him. Yeah. Um, I don't think that he's handled it like the best. There's no. been a lot of pomp and what well, have you. But there has. And, and he's got some people around him that aren't doing him any favors. Oh, yeah. no, in Bolton this. is no help in any Yeah, well, Pompeo either. I mean, they're both undermining this any way they can. But at the end of the day, it's better to be talking to them than to not you know yeah and and for the democrats to give him i mean it's it's really bad for them to be pushing that this is a bad thing mm-hmm. i mean i don't i don't think that's a winning argument no no um i think that uh i i don't think that there was a winner in night 1 yeah i i don't think that anybody did particularly well yeah uh in night 2 um i would say that the two people that kind of stood out yeah um in terms of like staying on point on policy, like actually getting some ideas out there instead of just, you know, little sound bites or not talking about anything specifically, but making being, a bunch of vague things. Yeah. Um, were uh, Andrew Yang, who I, yeah. I think did fine, although, man. He's out there. He yeah. scares me. We were talking the other night, and I, I stand by it. He scares me because I've, I've watched a few interviews with him, mm-hmm. and while I disagree with him, he makes a good argument. Like he's yeah. very good at framing his argument. Yeah. Um, which could be dangerous because it's a bad argument. <laughs> he gave the best closing statement, definitely. Yeah. Like, hands down, he gave so? the best closing statement. Yeah. Uh, the person who I would say had the best performance was probably Mayor Pete Pete Buttigieg. Pete Button stuff. Right. <laughs> Mayor Button stuff. <laughs> um, he uh, he also showed a lot of poise. He's the other military guy, by the yeah. way. Oh, really? I didn't um, know that. Yeah. Um, he uh, showed a lot of poise. 
he's not really going anywhere. I mean, he's he's got some charisma and and so forth, but uh, you just don't make the leap from mayor of South Bend to president of the United States. You just, well, you know, I don't think he's happen. making it to president of the United States, but I he's not getting the nomination. You either. don't think They're, so? No, no. I don't know, man. I just I look at that field and I don't know who else it is. I because... still think it's Hillary. Well, <laughs> hey, you may not be wrong about that. Yeah, I, I think she's jumping in. You know, at the end. Yeah, I, and I, I think you could be right mm-hmm. um, because I just I look at that field. and I don't see anybody, man. Yeah. Um, Bernie just doesn't have the strength. Biden's a loser. He's not going to do it. And and I don't know <laughs> who Blasio else it is. is such a douche. Yeah, like, he's oh, so man. unlikable. I hate him <laughs> so much. Like so much. I yeah. hate him. Like and yeah. have for a long time. Yeah. I mean that's oh man. I didn't even realize he was in the race, which I don't know how I missed that because like I've hated him for a long time. Like mm. I didn't I missed his announcement apparently. Yeah, he's just he's just terrible. So he's terrible. Now some of the things that they all talked about, um, they talked about their uh gun control stuff. Yeah. Uh they generally managed to avoid answering the question of whether they would forcibly take people's guns from them. But it was pretty clear that they would. They would, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there's uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was. I think it was uh, Swalwell, um, who's a California uh, congressman. Yeah. Um, or, like, federal congress, but from California. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, think they're, I think it was him that they were talking to. Anyway, he was... Talking about a federal buyback program that will, you know, buy back all the you Australian you keep, style buyback. Is sure, that what we're talking I guess, about? I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, suppose. I mean, yeah. um, he's like, you can keep your your handguns and you can keep your rifles, but we're going to buy back all the the, the assault weapons. The assault and for weapons. For people who exactly. can't see me, I'm using quote air quotes. Yes, <laughs> um, the assault weapons and. I, of course, you know, my, my thought was like, do you even have a definition for that term? Because, like, of course he does. It's the scary looking ones. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I just feel like if you if you put an AR down next to uh, another semi-automatic rifle, same caliber, yeah. um, with a wooden stock, and say, which one of these are we supposed to buy back? He would say the AR and not the one with the wooden stock, even though they're, they're essentially the same weapon. functionally the same weapon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but. Whatever. Anyway, uh, so he they said, well, but would you um, confiscate weapons? And he said, well, if we're buying them back, it's not confiscation. It is if I don't give mine back. <laughs> yeah, and the, and they didn't press the question and be like, well, what about the people that don't sell their weapons back because, to you? Because guess what? The state of Texas ain't doing it. Good Our luck. State. Good. Oh, well, no question. Alabama yeah. too. I mean, I use yeah. Texas because it's the biggest state. Yeah. But it's no different in Alabama. Like yeah. you, you come in here looking for guns. <laughs> you you just gonna try. find them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh so. man, I, you'd have uh, law for Alabama law enforcement standing at the yeah. border keeping people. No out. joke. <laughs> like, no, no joke. And sheriffs I mean, would finally well, be doing their jobs and protecting we, us from the federal government. You know, we joke, but <laughs> it would be. Uh, it would be another civil war. Mm. I mean, you could you could easily incite a civil war through this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know. Um, then there's you know a bunch of borders questions, of course. Yeah. Uh, and um, and then the, there was the craziest question. So they're all essentially for open borders, like varying degrees of of <laughs> open borders. And I mean, there's still some kind of control. I actually read an interesting article by our old buddy uh, Jacob Hornberger. Oh yeah. The other day, um, talking about this. And he he was actually talking about that there's essentially no difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. That it's not a matter of principle, it's a matter of degree. Yeah. And he said, you know, he was talking about how the Democrats and the Republicans both want controls yeah. of the border. They want central planning of immigration. Um, and that the libertarian position would be no central planning, essentially. The, you know, open yeah. immigration. Of course, in the libertarian position, it's open borders. Like, people can come through... Yeah. Like you don't have limitations <laughs> on people's movements except for private property. Yeah. But but you'd still have points of entry well, where people could just flow through. Yeah, yeah. I, exactly. I mean because and, when we pressed Hornberger on that that's what that was his was his answer is yeah. that and, uh, you know, an interesting, I, I thought his point was interesting about this. And, like, it depends on if you're, like, going into the collapsitarian mode or not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was asking him about, like, you can't possibly support open open borders with the welfare state. Yeah. And he said, well, I think that the answer to the welfare state is open borders. Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, I remember I know, that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, I so, remember that. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, you let all these people in and the welfare state's going to collapse really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> like, you well. don't have to worry about that. That'll put an end to the welfare state fast. Oh. Um, well, either people well, will get rid of it because they're like, no, this can't be, you can't do this. Yeah. Or it'll just run out of money. Yeah. Um, well, I way. mean, here's the problem, though, and here's where I disagree with that. Okay, yeah, it the government doesn't run out of money. That's <laughs> that's kind of the problem. Like, if the government was going to run out of money, it ran out of money a long time ago. Yeah, we're twenty trillion dollars in debt. Exactly. I think, so, yeah. I mean, I think that's that would be my first disagreement with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and but honestly, I mean, that's not that much different than what the Democrats and these debates were pretty well. I mean, they were all pretty well on board with um, Im- immigrant or illegal immigrants getting free health care. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, no. Everybody raised their yeah, hand. They were they were all in for that. So, yeah. Um, and that's just absurd. I mean, you know, think about the guy anywhere in the world. I, I was reading an article today about some guy in Africa with um, some kind of real serious cancer and he couldn't get treatment where he was. Uh, Nigeria or somewhere I can't remember yeah. anyway so what's to stop him from just coming to the US and getting, getting on treatment, the plane yeah. getting cancer treatment on the taxpayer dollar on the US taxpayer dollar yeah it'd be no different I mean, exactly. it would be, and and get these countries that do have this mm-hmm. you can't do that you can't just go to Canada and get like whatever you need like healthcare yeah. like you you can't do it yeah so well, even the canadians don't get whatever they need no yeah they, i mean there's yeah. limitations even on that yeah. that nobody seems to understand at some point you got some bureaucrat deciding what treatment is worthwhile and what isn't yeah absolutely absolutely there's and, no and other way it can work yeah i, I mean yeah, exactly yeah. so that's why rich canadians come to the u.s for health care <laughs> exactly <laughs> um so, yeah, no, that was just the most absurd thing. Now, the good news in all of this is that you can pretty much ignore primary debates. At this they stage. are appealing to the farthest left, just like in the Republican primary debates. They are appealing oh, to man. the farthest right. And I remember um, the ones from a few years ago, the past two cycles before this. Yeah. So, I mean, you know. It's just how it works because they're looking for primary voters. They're trying to yeah. get primary voters. And it's only the the far ends of the spectrum that actually vote in the primaries for the most part. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, there are people in the middle but that go what, vote in primaries, but... What they don't... This stuff is going to hurt them so bad in the general. Well, and that's I mean, the thing. All they're really doing is providing a whole bunch of sound bites for Trump ads. they're putting their self on record for some stuff they're going to be running from once they get the nomination. Yeah. You, uh, well, maybe. I mean, if they're smart, they would be running from it. I mean, yeah. I don't know that they will. I, I think that's that true. they may believe that they can win on some of these ideas, but I assure you they can't. Yeah, they're they're in they're probably entrenched in some kind of weird milieu but where everybody believes all of this. Yeah. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the majority of Americans are not in favor of letting everybody in and Mm-mm. then American taxpayers paying for everything that they yeah, need. That's Trump wins that election every time. Without yeah. question. Like I mean you can't you can't argue for that. I yeah. mean there are people in this country that believe that, but they're not the majority. No. I mean they're just not. No. So, um, so I, I, I hate to end on this bad note, but I think we're wrapping up. Yeah, here. it's probably time to wrap it up. Um, it, it's getting warm in here. It's time to <laughs> it is, I'm turn, sweating. turn the air conditioner back <laughs> on. Um, but uh, so last week, um, Justin Raimondo died. Yeah. Uh, Justin Raimondo was um, one of the founders of AntiWar.com. Ah. Um, he he and a, and another guy started the site in 1995. Really? And wow, I didn't realize it had been there that long. Well, yeah. maybe that's why it's got the good name. Um, and you know, this is one of my everyday stops, and yeah. uh, so I, and I it has only been an everyday stop for me for a, maybe a year now. Yeah. Um, so I actually haven't gotten to read that many Justin Raimondo art- articles because he he died of cancer. He'd been in stage four cancer for a while, yeah. so he wasn't. He writing hasn't been writing much that frequently. Yeah. Um, but over the last couple of days. Uh, I have been reading a bunch of his old articles, like from 2000. Oh, wow. And uh, I came across this one, and there was just this paragraph in there that I thought was so prescient. And it it really illustrates well the, his style of writing, because he's yeah. just an excellent writer. Like, yeah. his... His style is very nice. It's very literary. It's and, yeah. and it's full of information. And he's a great libertarian. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like his, his stuff is really good. I, I highly recommend. He wrote something like three thousand articles for AntiWar.com. Oh, wow. So wow. Uh, over his career. So I, I recommend anybody go to uh, AntiWar.com. They have a, a, a thing up about him now because because he just died last week. He was such an important part of the site. Yeah. So you know there there's various tributes and so forth um, about him anyway. Um, but. Uh, you can just click on his name. He's still listed as a regular contributor, yeah. and you can see his entire article archive. Wow. And I say just pick some at random. Yeah, like look it's around until kind of... you see a title that sounds interesting to you, and just yeah. read it. Because something the guy, you want to learn about and yeah. click on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the guy is just—he's a fantastic writer, and he's full of information. And so I came across this article from April two thousand. Okay. I just want to read this bit, kind of a little tribute to Justin Raimondo. Um, who I have come to respect way more over the last few days when I've read like well, two dozen read articles. Some of his stuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah, from him because I'd only read maybe a dozen before because he just wasn't writing that regularly. Yeah, but um, so the title of the article is "Who Won the Cold War?" The answer may surprise you, and so, and I may as well give away the conclusion. The conclusion was the social or the the democratic socialist. Oh yeah, um, that's the surprise answer. It wasn't the Bolsheviks and it wasn't the capitalists. Yeah. It was the, the democratic socialists who, by the end of the Cold War, had more or less taken over Europe and are sweeping across America now. Yeah. Um, but I just thought that this, this particular paragraph was just so interesting and so good. Um, he said, uh, or wrote, I guess he didn't say. He probably said. He might have said. Who yeah. knows? Um, he wrote, uh, Buchanan, uh, and this is Pat Buchanan. Okay. Um, Buchanan's rhetoric defined the new battle lines clearly enough. Years before the Kosovo War, on one side, an internationalist liberalism is asserting its right to intervene anywhere and everywhere in the name of human rights and democratic values, while the patriots of every country unite in their opposition to the globalist agenda. This is the major issue of the new millennium, the challenge confronting both those libertarian sympathizers on the left as well as the right who fear that freedom will wither in the shadow of the rising global colossus. For what is emerging through the mists of the new millennium is an evolving world government, an interlocking directorate of transnational corporate and political elites that increasing resorts to the use of force to achieve its goal of global hegemony. Hmm. And yeah. that was almost <laughs> 20 years ago, you write that. Yeah, right. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and, and this is something you may remember, we weren't doing the podcast, well, we weren't publishing the podcast <laughs> yeah, well. at the time but uh during the last election I, I i was talking about how this is the new these are the new lines that are dividing it's yeah. not left and right it's not it's not republican and democrat it's yeah. the globalist versus the nationalist or the regionalist or whatever the populist exactly. whatever you want to call it yeah and that's why um bernie and trump did so well because yeah. bernie and trump have a lot more in common than you may think on the outside because oh, they're yeah. both focused at home yeah Oh, absolutely. Um, They're not globalist. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people after uh, Hillary won the primary, won, oh, yeah, <laughs> here's right. our quotes again, <laughs> yeah. won the primaries, um, moved to be Trump voters instead of Democrat voters. Yeah, because because uh, Clinton's a globalist. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is the danger of the Paris Accord and the UN mm -hmm. and NATO and all of these, yeah. these huge multinational governmental groups. Yeah. Because they, because they, they form, and then they want more and more power. So yeah. eventually, your home government. Once it goes back to one of our principles, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a government further from home. Yeah, I mean, this is scary to a lot of people, including me. Oh, absolutely. You just see a government that's farther and farther away from you. Yep. That you can no longer access and has no interest or or knowledge of what you're doing or how you need to live your life. Exactly. Um. And uh. So yeah. He, he foresaw a lot of this. I mean, some people, and I was amazed actually looking through his articles at some of the things that he that he talked about that I was like, yeah, well, about 10 years after he wrote that, that was real clear. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, He's been bared out. <laughs> so um, he, uh, he was clearly just one of those people that really saw to um, the heart of movements or, yeah. or, you know, he really saw the currents. Yeah. Like Which moving way forward, we're going, yeah. and um, and that's that's an uh, that's an incredible skill that I'm not sure that I have. I, I haven't really looked that much. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of a friend of mine that uh, has always been really good at 
identifying people's motives for yeah. the actions that they take. Yeah. Uh, she just see, sees through to the core of it, even if they What's, don't understand it. Yeah. Like, she sees through to people's motives that they don't realize are their motives. That's just their subconscious. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, wow. And she's, you know, sh- and she's rarely wrong. Yeah. Uh, and that's just, uh, you know, some people just have these innate talents of like picking out this kind of thing. And um, yeah. so I, I've been really impressed with this guy. And it's a great loss to the liberty movement and to the anti-war movement that this guy that, that he died. Yeah. So, uh, you know, rest in peace, Justin Raimondo. Um, and, uh, you know, let's keep fighting the globalists, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so with that kind of sad ending, I suppose, um, we'll, uh, we'll just call it a night. And uh, remember, everybody, um, to follow and like and share, uh, especially like share. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, that, that seems to help yep. get our stuff in front of more people. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and uh, you can um, subscribe to us on iTunes and leave a review. And uh, is that all our stuff? I mean, right. we still have a website. Yeah. Um, I, I will eventually write again. <laughs> I promise I will. I keep saying that. Like Maybe putting it out here on the air ought to motivate me to do it, but I haven't yet. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple articles that I have been thinking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that you've been considering <laughs> well, I've got, writing? <laughs> I, I've got a bunch of articles that are close. Well, that's what I was fixing to say. I mean, let's you know. close some of those out. Man. All right. Well, well I'll start sending people. them to you. You can tell me how I'm supposed to finish it. I can um, do that. And uh, so, but I do have a couple articles that I want to write that I, I think will be good. And I've been kind of fleshing out the ideas in my head because that's how I usually do. It. And then I sit down and I write all at once, yeah, more or less, except for that last 15%, 20% that I just <laughs> that can't, you can't to close out. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like and share and uh, join us again. Um, we'll be back in about a week and then we may take a week off. Although I've been thinking about publishing one of the old podcasts that we recorded way back in the day that ah. we never put out there. Interesting. Um, when I'm I'm on vacation for a week in some place much cooler than it is here, <laughs> and uh, so we may put one of those out, and okay. um, we'll probably record about a week from now again and get another episode out before I go on vacation. Yep. And uh, we'll try and uh, we'll try and get it right next time. And in the meantime, everybody try and stay free. Train how you fight. Yeah. Ciao. Later. <laughs>